St. Bridget's Day, about which you've heard a lot already, and the fact that tomorrow is first the, the, the birthday of James Joyce, 2nd of February, Candlemas Day. He was uh, born in um, 1882, um, but it's also the centenary of the, the publication of Ulysses. Um, Ulysses turns 100 tomorrow, and Joyce and Ulysses shared a birthday, in effect. Um, as you've heard already, St. Bridget is a dual figure, or at least a dual figure, a pagan goddess and a, a Christian saint. But the two figures, if we even believe that we can separate them out, also interfuse and shade into each other um, over time. And I think one of the aspects of Bridget that will become important in the future to women in Ireland as we celebrate a new national day, Patrick is getting two days this year, by the way, 17th and 18th they are <laughs> going to be um, holidays, is that Bridget is a malleable saint. Um, she changed. And so the, the pagan rituals and um, all of the knowledge and lore linked with Bridget got very easily absorbed into Bridget the Saint. And Bridget the Saint actually is as interesting as Bridget the, the pagan goddess. So we need to keep, uh, bear both in mind. Um, offerings were left for Bridget on the 31st of January in people's houses. They held um, simple meals, but with typical food, often involving dairy products. And Bridget vis duly visited the houses, and um, pieces of her broth and her cloak got distributed, and particularly were sewn into the garments of young women. And the forearm Bridget's cross, which most of us are very familiar with, and I see some lovely brooches, as well as the, the logo um, for tonight, uh, here in the, the embassy was associated more, I think, with the Christian saint than, than the, the pagan goddess. And these Bridget's crosses were placed over lintels or entrances or in, in uh, the main rooms of people's houses. And they were to aid fertility and growth. And the nuns definitely never told me that it was linked with <laughs> fertility, but um, this is the case. And the Bridget's cross um, was there also to safeguard houses. And British is very much a folk tradition as well. The Bridget cross could be moved around by farmers. If there are animals that needed protection, then the cross would migrate from kitchen to farmyard and so on. And as you will see in a moment, uh, many of the aspects uh, of Bridget that are important. She was a woman of learning and above all linked with natural cycles of growth, with procreation, with benevolence and hospitality and regeneration. All of these themes will come up in different ways in what you're going to hear. Not surprisingly, St. Bridget is duly noted in the long roll call of saints, both actual, spurious and fictional, in the Cyclops episode of Ulysses. And in the Ithaca episode, um, we're given a list of the many key Irish sites um, that Leopold Bloom plans to visit, including the, the Giant's Causeway and so on. And on the list is Bridget's Elm in Kildare. That is the place where she established her nonner nonnery. The topic of Joyce and women is, of course, a very large-scale one. It's striking that even though Joyce seems to be the epitome of the solitary, iconoclastic male genius, he perennially attracted women who were radically feminist, um, but in very individualistic and different ways. Nor Barnacle, his lifelong con consort, um, shared and participated in his transgressive and defiant approach to life, even if she refused the role of the decorous literary wife. She never became that. Joyce's editors and sponsors were, in the main, politically radical women who promoted and enabled his work. Jane Heap and Margaret Anderson, who serialised Ulysses in The Little Review, and I'm sitting beside a specialist on this topic. Sylvia Beach, publisher of Ulysses. Ulysses would not have been published without her. And Harriet Shaw Weaver, his endlessly generous patron and confidant, um, especially during the composition of Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, who through her her financial support of Joyce made his overall artistic project feasible, especially in the later decades of his life. Women are at once central and peripheral to Joyce's works. Greta Conroy in The Dead, Gertie MacDowell and Molly Bloom in Ulysses, Izzy and Anna Levia Pluribel in Finnegan's Wake. 
They may be wives or mothers or lovelorn young women, but they always destabilize Joyce's text in some way and produce moments of excess and of piercing and unsettling insight. The bird girl on Dolly Strand in a portrait of the artist as a young man, Gertie McDowell limping on Sandy Strand. Molly Bloom's acerbic nocturnal monologue, which outstrips and goes beyond the work Ulysses, of which it is a part, and Anne Olivia's Trinity, which rounds out Finnegan's Wake. Early feminist scholarship debated the degree to which Joyce exposes or ultimately aligns with patriarchy in depicting women in his texts and examine the stereotypical aspects of his female figures. More recent and current feminist approaches to Joyce's work um, are less concerned, I think, with taking sides or calling out masculinist failing in Joyce. Um, rather, now the feminist endeavour, as I think will be borne out by our um, panel tonight, is engaged in carrying forward Joyce's aesthetic credo and harnessing and making over his generative vision of his work. I'll introduce our three speakers and performers in the order in which they're presenting. Um, you will first and last um, hear Janet Morn, um, who is an actor, playwright and director based in Dublin. Her selected acting work includes Ulysses, The Plough and the Stars, <coughs> Translations, Juno and the Peacock, um, No Romance at the Abbey Theatre, Car Show, Dublin by Lamplight, Everyday Free Fall, and Desire Under the Alms for Corn Exchange Theatre Company. Janet co-wrote and performed in the, the hit play Swing, published by Bloomsbury in 2015. She also wrote and directed a holy show, which played a sellout run in the Peacock Theatre in the Dublin Fringe Festival and subsequently toured in 2020. And this same show, a holy show, um, was adapted for RTE radio dra um, drama on one. Um, our second speaker is Dr. Claire Hurton, who is reader in English and Digital Humanities at Lockbury University. Claire grew up in Dublin, but has lived in England for many years. Um, she has recently curated, and it's um, pending, just due to open, Women and the Making of Ulysses, a centenary exhibition at the Harry Ransom Centre in Austin. This exhibition explores the role which women played in helping Joyce to realise Ulysses. Claire is the author of Serial Encounters, Ulysses and the Little Review, which is due out in paperback later this month. And on the 10th of March, Claire is giving a lecture online in the, the British Library, Finding Miss Weaver, James Joyce and the Patron of Ulysses, and you can book for this on the, the BL website. And our final um, speaker and performer is Jessica Trainer, a poet, essayist, and librettist. Her debut poetry collection, Liffey Swim, published by Daedalus Press in 2014, was shortlisted for the Strong Shine Award, and in 2016 was named the best, one of the best poetry debuts of the past five years on Bustle.com. The Quick was a 2019 Irish Times poetry choice. And Jessica has won numerous awards. They include the Ireland Chair of Poetry Bursary and Hennessy New Writer of the Year. Paper Boat, a new opera commission, will premiere in 2022. Her residencies, um, and this is just this between last year and this year, 21 to 22, include the Yates Society in Sligo, the Seamus Heaney Home Place, Dunleary Ratdown Lexicon, the wonderful library and art centre there. And um, Jessica Trainer is also a creative fellow of University College Dublin. And excitingly too, her next poetry collection, Pish Lullabies, is forthcoming this year from Blood Axe Books and is a Poetry Book Society recommendation. So I hand you over first to Janet Moore. Hi. Um, my first encounter with Joyce as a performer was when I was asked to play Molly Bloom in the Abbey Theatre production of Ulysses. And I thought that was, uh, as well as obviously being a great gift, was a real challenge because how on earth do you embody interiority? How do you play uh, an interior monologue for an audience? But um, that wasn't challenging enough. So uh, foolishly, I, I'm working this year with the Irish composer Ronan Guilfoyle 
to create a new piece. Um, he's writing, a, uh, composing a piece of music for six jazz musicians. And I will perform with them uh, reading ex excerpts from Ju Ulysses. So we've started working with that, like it's such a mammoth uh, task, but funnily enough, one of the most challenging chapters is the chapter Oxen of the Sun, but it's, it's got such linguistic gymnastics and such rhythm um, that actually it does lend itself to a kind of uh, musicality. And this piece uh, is about the birth of uh, Mina Purefoy's long awaited child. And I hope speaks to what some of the others will say. I'm sure Anne will have to correct my German, so forgive me. <clears throat> the air without is impregnated with rain dew moisture, life essence celestial, glistening on Dublin stone there under star shiny Keelum. God's air, the All Father's air, scintillant, circumnambient, sessile air. Breathe it deep into thee by heaven. Theodore, purify, thou hast done a doughty deed and no botch. Thou art, I vow, the remarkablest progenitor, barring none in this chaffering, all including most foragonous chronicle. Astounding! In her lay a God-framed, God-given, preformed possibility, which thou hast fructified with thy modicum of man's work. Cleave to her, serve, toil on, labour like a very band dog, and let scholarment and all Malthusias go hang. Thou art all their daddies, Theodore. Art drooping under thy load, be moiled with butchers' bills at home and ingots not thine in the counting house, head up. For every new begotten thou shalt gather thy homer of ripe wheat. See, thy fleece is drenched. Dost envy Darby Dullman there with his Joan? A canting jay and a rheum-eyed cur dog is all their progeny. Pshaw, I tell thee, he is a mule, a dead gastropod without vim or stamina, not worth a cracked kreutzer. Copulation without population? No, say I. Herod's slaughter of the innocents were the truer name. Vegetables, forsooth, and sterile cohabitation. Give her beefsteaks, red, raw, bleeding. She is a hoary pandemonium of ills, enlarged glands, mumps, quinsy, bunions, hay fever, bed sores, ringworm, floating kidney, derbyshire, neck, warts, bilious attacks, gallstones, cold feet, varicose veins. A truce to threens and trentals and jeremies and all such congenital defunct of music. Twenty years of it regret them not. With thee it was not as with many that will and would and wait and never do. Thou sawest thy America, thy life task, and its charge to cover like the transpontine bison. How saith Zarathustra? Deine kutrupsel melkest du, nun trinkest du die susa milk des oiters. See, it displodes for thee in abundance. Drink man an udderful, mother's milk, pure foy, the milk of human kin, milk too of those burgeoning stars overhead, rutilant in thin rain vapor, punch milk such as those rioters will quaff in their guzzling den, milk of madness, the honey milk of Canaan's land. Thy cow's dug was tough, what I? But her milk is hot and sweet and fattening. No dollop this, but thick, rich, bonny clabber. To her, old patriarch, pap, per diem partulum et pertundum nunc est bebendum. <laughs> So I'll give it Claire Hutton. Thank you very much. Mine's a bit sad and somber for a day of celebration, so apologies. I can squeeze a joke in, but um, I'll, I'll, try, I'll have to work hard. Um, so I'm going to put in a word for Joyce's mother, remembered so vividly in the pages of Ulysses. And I'm going to begin with a little reading, uh, chapter one. Her secrets. Old feather fans, tasseled dance cards, powdered with musk, a gaud of amber beads in her locked drawer, a bird cage hung in the sunny window of her house when she was a girl. Memories beset his brooding brain, her glass of water from the kitchen tap when she had approached the sacrament, a cored apple filled with brown sugar 
roasting for her at the hob on a dark autumn evening. Her shapely fingernails reddened by the blood of squashed lice from the children's shirts. In a dream, silently, she had come to him, her wasted body within its loose grave clothes giving off an odour of wax and rosewood, her breath bent over him with mute secret words, a faint odour of wetted ashes. Her glazing eyes staring out of death to shake and bend my soul on me alone, the ghost candle to light her agony ghostly light on the tortured face, her hoarse, loud breath rattling in horror while all prayed on their knees, her eyes on me to strike me down. To my eyes, that is one of the first big emotional hits in Ulysses. It's page six, and if you don't kind of go, whoa, mm -hmm. you know, there's something going on. There's really, it's quite a remarkable passage. Um, Hmm. What I want to do is to say a bit about the life behind the fiction. Um, in the exhibition that I've curated, um, we've put some of May Joyce's correspondence on display, including a lengthy letter which she sent to her son when he was in Paris in March 1903. It's an eight-page letter and it's very vivid um, and it's almost illegible, but I'm going to just give you a little flavour to kind of contrast with the text. My dearest Jim, your pappy has given me the enclosed to send you, £1.12, shillings, which will make you safe with your landlady until the end of the month. He was very pleased you wrote to him, and I hope you will do so frequently. Do not mind me. I will hear all the news about you and will understand. And so, you know, that's, that's the flavour of this letter. Um, well, so much has been written about Joyce's father, and frankly, I'm a bit sick of this, actually, because <laughs> it's, it's pretty much borders on hagiography, and I'm putting in a word here for a kind of feminist redress in the biography of James Joyce. This letter gives such a deep sense of the connection and trust that existed between Joyce and his mother and a deep sense of Joyce's family more generally. And actually, in the eight pages, she goes through and mentions six of the 10 surviving children born to the parents between 1881 and 1893. It's like a kind of worry bead structure. Joyce's mother held the family together, and she obviously had high regard for her eldest son. Her letter is notably focused on practical issues and including, apart from the cash for the <coughs> landlady, you know, she has advice on how to get started in journalism. She <laughs> makes an undertaking to get a suit cleaned. That's the joke. Send your suit back from Paris to Dublin. I'll get it so sorted for you and I'll send it over. That's, that's the funny bit. So she also has prayers for um, Joyce's spiritual and temporal welfare. And the style is just very endearing. She, she says she's simply talking just as we would do at the, at the fire. Well, just five uh, weeks after the letter was received, Joyce received an urgent telegram from the father calling her home. Mother dying, come home father, it said, if the testimony of Ulysses as autobiography is to be believed. Age 44, May Joyce died four months later. And after she died, Joyce told Nora, my mother was slowly killed, I think, by my father's ill treatment, by years of trouble, by my cynical frankness of conduct. When I looked on her face as she lay in her coffin, a face grey and wasted with cancer, I understood that I was looking on the face of a victim, and I cursed the system which had made her a victim. Ten children survived. The full birth history is far more extreme. Between 1880 and 1897, there were at least six other pregnancies, which ended in either infant death, stillbirth, or miscarriage. This equates to one pregnancy a year. Perhaps then John Stanislaus Joyce is not emerging as such a great figure in this story. May Joyce was a vivid presence in the life of her eldest son and was for a time the centre of his emotional world. Her unstinting belief in him was formative for his creative self-confidence and her premature death hardened his determination to succeed and served him with a depth of emotional experience which he could immediately draw on in his writing. 
In the course of so many moves from place to place, Joyce did not ordinarily keep personal correspondence. Somehow, and miraculously, he kept hold of this letter. It's a tiny fragment of a rich and complicated life, and it shows the significance of, mother's, of, of Joyce's mother's um, uh, position in his formation. It also points, of course, to the fundamental correlation between Joyce's life and the life depicted in the fiction. Thank you. Jessica Trainer. Um, so I'm going to start with a, with a poem from my first collection, which has a Ulysses reference and which kind of sparked my response to the theme of uh, Joyce and women. Headline. All the letters escaped from the paper have been pixelated for our reading pleasure. No more the smudge of newsprint, that temporary stain like a kiss between thumb and page, words blurred by fingerprints maze. And that labyrinth momentarily defined by ink that defies all permanence. What's truth this morning by night is privy paper, my Ulysses reference, or kindling my 1980s childhood, or a blanket for a homeless man, that song we learnt in religion class. And as I walk temple bars, rain wet cobblestones, words glide along the channels, dissolve in oil glazed puddles, and shout at me from acid coloured posters until the technicolour blurs to monochrome and the great unwritten headline of our century roars from the hoarding on a derelict site. Babies stolen, babies stolen, suffering, suffering, suffering. So I've chosen to open with this poem for a few reasons. Of course, as I said, there is that Ulysses reference, but also I took the final lines from the poem from an art installation by Mannix Flynn, which made reference to the mother and baby homes and also the trafficking of adopted children, um, which was uh, just placed in Temple Bar for a couple of years, I think around 2011, 2012, and which kind of weathered um, in a really, really effective way um, until it looked like it had been there for a really, really long time. Um, but when I was asked by the embassy to write something on women in Ulysses, I came back to this poem and also began to think about childbirth um, and Oxen of the Sun in particular. And we were laughing about how we'd kind of all been drawn to this really bloody difficult section of the book. Um, but, you know, just to give a little talk about it, I suppose it's the moment where Mina Purefoy's labour is set against a whistle-stop tour of literary tropes from the pagan to the contemporary. And we heard uh, Janet reading some of that there. It's just fantastic. It's a really, really rich section. Um, and it's one of the most famously challenging sections of the book. And it's the place where I gave up three times <laughs> in my attempts to read it. Um, it's a long literary labour of love, a love letter to various historical prose styles, a meditation on the interwoven nature of form and content, and it's also a bunch of drunk men chatting while a woman gives birth off stage. <laughs> so Bloom has come to check in on Mina Purifoy at Hollis Street as she enters the third day of her labour. And um, before giving birth myself, the idea of a three-day labour was a terrible but very distant concept. And I wonder if I might have found parallels between it and the process of writing, as Joyce seems to hear. And um, I certainly don't now, except in an extremely superficial sense of two <laughs> parallel acts of creation. Mina herself is so silent on the subject, and although she is of course fictional, it's hard not to imagine this as one of the many silences that accreted in Irish society over the course of the 20th century. Those silences that led to those unwritten headlines, especially around the fates of women and children. And by a really strange coincidence on my flight this morning from Dublin to Heathrow, I was sitting next to an Irish woman in her 60s who was meeting her birth sister in London for the first time today. And she said to me, and it was very, very striking, she said that she had been sold as a baby. Um, but back to Oxen of the Sun. In this section, as in other episodes of the book, Bloom is contrasted with his fellow drinkers in a really interesting way. We're privy to his inner life, his empathy, his curiosity around the birthing process. Stephen, Lynch, Dixon, Madden and the rest are less engaged. We don't have the same access to their inner lives, bar Stephen in mourning for his own mother. But the tensions around motherhood and birth in the book as a whole are really fascinating. I think we can all agree, if we've read the book, that it's Bloom's curiosity around human nature and lives and experiences of others that make him such an engaging character. He's open, uncertain, awake to the suffering of those around him. Joyce sees these features as being, in their way, 
maternal. And in Circe, the section which follows, Bloom states openly, oh, I so want to be a mother before giving birth to eight phantasmagorical children. He doesn't have to look after them afterwards, it's okay. Mina, up in the ward, is unaware of the literary labour that's taking place downstairs. And I think various critics have written Stephen's viewpoint is that women give birth to children and men give birth to books. Um, but the concern that and interest that Bloom shows in the notion of motherhood is quite intriguing, given the era in which the book was written, as are the psychological explorations throughout of desire and thwarted, desired and thwarted motherhoods, such as Stephen's inability to write his own opus. But it is frustrating as a woman and a writer that the binary this carry comparison creates disbars mothers a little bit from the world of ideas. I think although Ulysses broke ground in its project to imagine and inhabit and represent the female psyche, the women in the book are firmly on one side of the fence, away from the world of free roaming artistic ideas. Prized cattle hoarded by jealous gods, they are possessed by various men. Um, and that goes back to the kind of origin myth the oxen of the sun myth with Odysseus and the inability to possess these sacred cows. Mm -hmm. Sacred cows. Um, in the months after giving birth myself, I too spent time disbarred from the world of ideas. I was granted the domestic sphere as if it was my natural habitat. Um, of course, I want to acknowledge that maternity leave is a fantastic thing mm -hmm. and a structure that suits very many people. And it's also not my intention to blame Joyce for any of these dynamics. In fact, I really do believe that Ulysses works against them in many ways, as I think we've, we've talked about. But it's hardly immune to the received ideas of the time. So in thinking about Ulysses and women, about Oxen of the Sun, about that woman on the plane this morning and the parallels drawn between experiences of childbirth and artistic creation, I thought I might finish by sharing a poem that gives birth to my own birthing experience. And this is for Mina, all the women on that imaginary ward and the real woman on the plane this morning. In the birthing room, the choir sings pitchy and off key, but still my hands grasp, flutter, try to shape these unruly phrases till the drag of morphine collapses them. I can't read the singers' faces behind their masks and the lighting is bad. Pale green gowns, glinting implements, very postmodern, post dramatic. But they won't stand still. One soloist bends over me, very quiet, very serious. And the music must be good because I feel something tug in me, a root that shouldn't be disturbed. Don't cry, you're the conductor. Then for some reason I'm given a prize, but it's a baby, her eyes black. We look at each other. There must be some mistake before she's taken away. It's quiet when the clean-up team arrives. There is so much blood. I'm sorry, but do you know if I've been cut? Of course you have, they say. Thank you. And we return finally to Janet. From Wally. <laughs> I should say as well, uh, Stephen Joyce is probably rolling in his grave uh, anyway with me bringing jazz music to Ulysses. But I'm going to do the final, Molly's final speech. But uh, this is from Dermot Bulger's version that we did in the Abbey. So, so if you're missing any words, that's why. He's brought in some other things. Um, what an unearthly hour. Better lower this lamp and try again. What shall I wear? Shall I wear a white rose? I'd love to have the whole place swimming in roses. God, there's nothing like nature. The wild mountains and the waves rushing. And flowers, all shapes and colours springing up out in the ditches. The sun shines for you, he said. The day we were lying among the rhododendrons on Hoth Head. The day I got him to propose to me, yes. Oh my God, after that long kiss, I nearly lost my breath. Yes. He said I was a flower of the mountain. Yes. So we are flowers, all a woman's body. Yes. That was why I liked him, because I saw he understood or felt what a woman is, and I knew I could always get around him. And I gave him all the pleasure I could. 
leading him on till he asked me to say yes. And I wouldn't answer first. Only looked out over the sea and the sky. I was thinking of so many things he didn't know of. The sailors playing on the pier, and the Spanish girls laughing in their shawls, and the fowl market, and the poor donkey slipping half asleep, and the old castle thousands of years old, yes, and those handsome moors all in white, and turbans like kings asking you to sit down in their little bit of a shop. Oh, and the sea, crimson sometimes like fire, and the glorious sunsets, yes, and all the queer little streets and pink and blue and yellow houses and the rose gardens and the jasmine and geraniums and Gibraltar as a girl where I was a flower of the mountain, yes, when I put the rose in my hair like the Andalusian girls used, yes. Now he kissed me under the Moorish wall and I thought, well, as well him as another. Mm -hmm. And then I asked him with my eyes to ask again, yes. And then he asked me, would I yes to say yes, my mountain flower? And first I put my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me so he could feel my breast all perfume. <gasps> yes, and his heart was going like mad. And yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. It's always hard um, to, to follow that, <laughs> but um, we'll, we'll slowly move round. towards discussion and begin by exchanging a few points amongst ourselves and then open out to you. Just trying to sum up what you all said. We have Joyce's mother in actuality and the fictional representation of, of him and Ulysses and that, that very vivid passage that imagines her more fully than Joyce could in reality, fictionally. Mm -hmm. And then the conundrum of Mina Purifoy, who's always there with the, 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 the lengthy birth giving anyway, and they're in the background and somehow inspiring the language, but as you say, Jessica, parallel worlds mm -hmm. and parallel lines. And it always seems so odd that one of the public scenes in, in Ulysses is the, the, the male students getting together with mm -hmm. Stephen and, and Bloom there in, in Hollis Street. And then we have Molly, who is the least maternal of the figures mm -hmm. in, in Ulysses. So I'm just trying to, how do we sum it up? Is it ambivalence? I mean, Joyce manages to depict these women nonetheless. So is, is he reaching for a feminine style, a feminine um, perspective um, through his fiction? Or do, you know, are, is there still an ambiguity about what women represent in the Dublin of 1904 for sure, but maybe the Dublin of any era mm. up to our present moment? Mm -hmm. so. Gosh. I mean, I, I, was, I, I definitely think there is that ambiguity there, but I really do yep. admire his attempts to try and I admire the project of it and I've, yes. I've found it a, a book that I can be quite comfortable in because I think that a lot of a lot of the things that we might criticize Joyce for are absolutely still issues in society today a lot of the viewpoints it's not mm. like they've gone away it's not like he's this dinosaur you know and I thought it was so interesting Claire was it the the was it you who read the little bit uh, about the system that had destroyed his mother yeah. Uh, that quote could have been from today, I, fe I mm. feel. The language of that feels so contemporary in the way that we think about systemic issues around gender, I yeah. think, and his recognition of that and his clarity of that. And I think the clarity of understanding is a really positive first step and that ability to imagine is a really positive first step. It may not be the entirety of the corrective attitude needed, but it's, it's yeah. something special, yeah. I think, to be sure. Yeah. I was thinking to Claire, I mean, he, that, that searing letter, it's the most famous passage, I think, that Joyce wrote about looking at his mother in her coffin and recognising that he was looking at the face of a victim. But nonetheless, he generates his own ambition from that to leave. And it's, 
mm -hmm. sisters and some brothers actually who bear the burden of bringing up younger siblings and keeping that a very broken mm -hmm. family going be because the, the father w was obviously a central figure but yeah, um, didn't, didn't nurture the children at all. Uh, it was quite abusive on, on occasion. Mm. So again, there is, is this kind of split division in Joyce, who is nurturing in his own family, I think, mm. especially when yeah. it came to Lucia. So I wonder how you'd sum all that, all those differing aspects of him up, <laughs> or can we? <laughs> in, in two minutes, yeah, uh, one minute. I mean, you see, I think the experience of the mother's death is utterly formative for his hardening of a kind of determination. I mean, when he's in Paris um, and he gets that letter, he doesn't really know what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And she's trying to give him advice, mm -hmm. saying, you know, journalism. And um, there's some really lovely lines in the letter. She says, you know, you cannot get on in your line without friends. <laughs> You know, like, I mean, that's very interesting to give to, advice to give to someone who's 21. It's sort of mm. saying, you know, you are naive and feckless and get it together, yeah. you know. And, and, and then he has to go home. And when does he get it together? It's when, you know, he meets Nora and he sees this escape route. And it is an escape from responsibility. Because yeah. if he stayed in Dublin, at some level, the guilt would haunt him. And the guilt is so palpable in Ulysses. Mm. You know, misery, misery. There's one of his great kind of two-word two paragraphs. <laughs> when, he see, mm. when Stephen Dedalus meets his sister yeah. on the keys. Yeah. You know, misery, yeah. misery. You know, like, it's just, it's guilt. It's all guilt. I have to leave here, because otherwise, I'm going to have to wash the shirts. Yeah. and um, mind the kids and stir the porridge and all of those things. So he has to get out. And what does he do? He recreates this sort of family unit with a difference, yeah. far from home, and there's a sort of trail of sisters going out to, yes. you know. I mean, it's, it's a really fascinating kind of um, moment for him in his kind of determination to get going. I mean... There's so many things you could say about how he represents women. One of the things that interests me about Ulysses is the way he represents women in the world of work. Mm. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, um, I think that line about, um, you know, like, I mean, Miss Dunn as the typist. What does Miss mm. Dunn spend her time doing? She's got this very, you know, must be the world's worst boss in Blazes Bond, <laughs> you know, mm. and she's looking out the window and she's thinking about, you know, Mm. advertisements. Her head is not full of anything very substantial. Mm. Reading Wilkie Collins as well. Reading Wilkie mm. Collins, yeah. you know. And um, I like the way I like the way Bloom thinks about women too in the world of work. I think one of the most telling lines is that thing where he says he's going past the offices of the Irish Times and he's because he's in a, uh, he's in the world of marketing and advertisement. He thinks about marketing and kind of jingles and mm. what you can do with them all the time. And he says, you know, he's going past and he has in his mind wanted smart lady typist mm. to aid gentlemen in literary work. Ooh. That is so knowing. Yeah. That's what Joyce gets. <coughs> you yeah. know, that's what yeah. He, yeah. he achieves. Yeah. All, you know, he has a bank of smart lady typists, mm. you know, aiding mm. him. So, I mean, that to me is a very interesting kind of dialogue within the book. Mm. Um, but you could talk about women and Ulysses forever, so I better, yeah. you know. Could I ask you, Janet, one question before I um, broaden out um, to everyone in the, in the room? Um, performing Molly um, is so challenging um, because it's something to do with the rhythm of, mm. of her voice and finding a way in and then also fending off some of the stereotypical aspects yeah. that have crept into representations of Molly, things we hear um, that are we, we have in our head yeah. uh, when we approach whatever it is, a monologue. Um, because I love the nuance you, you brought to it. You sort of um, make it more realistic, but also um, much more wistful or other, mm. something different. Because we don't know where the, Molly happens at the end of the novel, actually when the, the novel really is over. And um, she's not talking to anyone. She could be dreaming, could be sleeping, she could be anywhere. Mm. Um, so really getting that voice is so difficult and yeah. it seems easy to read but it isn't because mm. of the, the the to and fro rhythms yes yeah. 
Mm. So I wonder if you could say more, even about the process of becoming yeah. Molly. In ah, <laughs> um, well, the, uh, when I started reading Penelope, it's, it, and I'd be cycling up and down to the lexicon, actually. I'd go down to the lexicon library in Delirium, and I'd read, and then I'd cycle home. And, and I, I was so in it all the time. I was love it. It was all so new to me, because I hadn't read Ulysses before. Um, and then my experience of reading Penelope is that then you become very aware of your own interior monologue and how dizzying it can be and how far and fast you can travel. And because I looked at uh, Sirka Cusack does a beautiful Molly, I think it's in a documentary with David Suchet, and she really does the, the speed of thought, she really goes for that. But I kind of felt like that wasn't going to work on stage because you have to be more physical, you have to be more connected to the audience yeah. and, and, and allow them in. Um, but I realised when I started listening to my own interior monologue that, mm. you know, even though you are bouncing from, uh, oh, oh, I'll stop in Tesco's, I'm really hungry, oh, he's an idiot, why did I say that? <laughs> and you're, you know, and it's all bum, bum, bum. But you also can very suddenly find yourself very holy in a very vivid and still uh, physical memory of some, whether it's sex or a gorgeous moment or uh, or anticipation of a great meal, and I started to realise that actually the rhythm, like everything, has to change. Like, you know, so so I think that was it. That uh, and then the the other th kind of main thing I tried to do, which I don't know, I got to do it twice, mm -hmm. and I hope I'm not finished with her yet. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I I tried to kind of use the audience as the inside of her brain, as if the whole theatre was inside yeah. her head, so I yeah. could pull the thoughts from the faces all around mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. But like I say, like such a gift and such a and such a beautiful challenge. Like you, you say, you could be talking about women in Joyce forever. You could be trying to work out how to play Molly Bloom forever as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I would...